This is Star Talk, Cosmic Queries Edition. And today's subject is Extremophiles and Alien Worlds. One of my favorite subjects. Chuck, what do you think about that topic? Uh, kind of sounds like aliens gone wild. <laughs> <laughs> Call right now. It's aliens gone wild. You've never seen aliens like this before. <laughs> Extremophiles. <laughs> I, I, I love me this sub, a little bit of this subject, and but we have a one of the world's experts on it on yeah. Star Talk today, Kenda Lynch. Kenda, welcome to Star Talk. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Excellent, excellent. You you have a PhD in this stuff, and but let me just alert people that your expertise is is some kind of amalgam of whole fields that were previously distinct from one another. Because I think of geology, and I think of biology, and I think of modern astrophysics, and you just took a big fat stapler and crammed them together. <laughs> And then you and you do all three of these all at once. How is that even possible? Um, it's called astrobiology. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you got to know your geology too, right? Um, you do have to know. Your, yeah, I mean, so yeah, it's kind of this interesting thing where you just got to learn to wear a lot of hats, and um, and you don't necessarily you you should have. I mean, ultimately, you have expertise in one thing a little bit more than the other, but you have to know enough about the others to kind of pull those pieces in because ultimately they all are really interconnected. And you also have to know when you don't know something and pull in the right people to work with you, but you have to be able to speak their language. So having that understanding of geology so I can talk to a hard rock geologist about, you know, how I think my bugs are eating their rock, you know, is important to <laughs> be able to have the same, you know, same conversation about it. Yeah. It's really Let important. me tell you something. This is why I love being on this show. <laughs> it's the only time you will ever hear somebody say, and I have to talk to them about how their bugs are eating my rock. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a, I not, did not see that sentence coming. I did not either. <laughs> but Kenda, you work on Earth. So mm -hmm. why, what does it have anything to do with aliens on other worlds? Well, I mean, the reality is, is when we're trying to understand life in the universe right now, we only have one data point, and that's Earth. So, um, you know, we have to kind of work on Earth and try to understand life here. And and really, when we think about it, it's a big question. How did life even come to be on Earth? How did life, Earth come to be this big cradle where there's lots of life just kind of crawling all over it and in it and everywhere? Let, let, and, me, let me help you with that, Kenda. Uh, <laughs> bugs started eating rocks. <laughs> <laughs> Chuck, Chuck is not going to shake that sentence for the, for the next five years. He's going to... Mm, yum, yum, yum. Tasty rocks. Yes. But, when we, but when we really try to understand looking for life in the universe, the, you know, a, a logical first question, and, and especially since we've tried and, and hadn't been too six, successful in the past looking for life on other planets was, well, how, do we, how well do we understand life here on Earth? Do we understand the extent of where life can live on Earth? Do we understand how life arose on Earth and kind of what did early life look like on Earth and and you know where can we go to look for it and what kind of environments did it live, live well, in and those okay. are a lot I'm, of I'm an old man here. When I learned about this, it was we need the 72 degree tide pool for Earth, for life to thrive on Earth. Yeah, yeah, that's how, that's yeah, how old no. I am. Right now, the, only, <laughs> one of the things that we have learned life is not comfortable unless it's room temperature <laughs> uh yeah no and it needs just the right amount of sugars and it needs and it needs this special kind of media no what we every have once in a while every once in a while life is just like who touched that thermostat <laughs> that's exactly right <laughs> now which one of y'all touched that thermostat <laughs> on its barco lounger it's it <laughs> that that would that would be that would be us as the life we, we're the it, ones that kind of need to we need we are the ones that glamp right? right but but microbial life man every time we think we got those bugs figured out they do something crazy and we're like wait what do you mean you can live on a nuclear reactor wait what do you mean you can live two kilometers down in a, in a subsurface in the subsurface and we find you when we're mining for gold? Right. What do you mean okay. you, what do you can yeah. live in like like super hot water that's also salty and acidic? What do you mean? Okay, wait a minute. Three sentences ago, you used the word glamp. Could you please, for anyone over fifty, could you just tell people what that word means, please? That's like it's like camping, but 
glamour camping, like bringing your house with you camping. So you, you maybe have like, you're not really camping. You're in the wild, but not really because maybe you like tow you still a get, big old if, like, house trailer with you and that's your camper. If you can still watch yeah. HBO in your trailer, you're not camping. Is that the yeah, right? yeah, basically. Basically. You know, if you've got, yeah, if you've got a hot tub and, you know, <laughs> and, and you've got your, and you've got, and you've got your, your, um, your Keurig or your Tosimo or your, what's the other one? If you got that making your coffee, you're not camping. Okay. That's why I camp at the Ritz Carlton. There you go. There, see. Okay, so you're a staff scientist at the at the storied Lunar and Planetary Science Institute. Um, mm-hmm. Is that right? Is that no? Uh, just Lunar and Planetary Institute. Is that what they call Lunar it? Lunar and Planetary Institute, correct? Yes. Right, right, mm-hmm. and um, that's based in Houston, Houston, Texas. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. we're especially interested in you today because you um, you're featured in episode two of Netflix's docu series Alien Worlds. Yes. So, yes. Um, uh, pick up the action for us. Where do, where where do we find you? Um, you find me uh, as far as in the episode. Yeah, right when we open up, right in the beginning, you see this alien landscape that kind of looks, to my, in my opinion, it looks like Mars. But we're actually in the uh, Dalal hydrothermal system, which is in the Danakil Depression in Ethiopia. So hydrothermal. This would be heat emerging from Earth's crust, Correct. manifesting. Uh, on the surface somehow right yeah hydrothermal meaning that it's um it's heat coming from the um from this the the earth's subsurface and in this case a hydrothermal system usually meets heat generated waters like geo generated um water manifesting up in the surface so there's water flowing in the subsurface passing over usually like a what we call a magma pocket there's a big pocket of lava and there's water flowing over it getting superheated and then pushing up to the earth's surface and boiling out and spewing out all sorts of hot gases and everything like that. And so at those, at those high system. temperatures, does it absorb a lot of minerals from the rocks that it passes through? It does. It absorbs a lot of minerals. So there's a lot of um, what we call um, and anions and cations. There's a lot of dissolved constituents, um, chemical constituents. And especially in the Dalal system, it also goes through su- a subsurface salt deposit. So not only is it getting minerals from like the, the, the from just like the, the ground, the subsurface rock, like over the magma pocket, pocket, but it's also picking up all these minerals and dissolving all these salt minerals. And so Dalal um, is amazing because it is, it's hydrothermal, really hot and super salty, salty hypersaline. And it's also acidic because there's also all this iron and sulfur that make it super acidic. And that's so, where you want to find life. <laughs> yeah, and it's, and it's what we call a poly extreme environment. And it's so amazing. And it's a it's a crazy challenge for life. And yet, um, you know, there's multiple teams of us working there that are finding evidence for life. In, wow. in this, in this environment. Okay, so, and, so, the, so the Dead Sea, which is a highly mm-hmm. salinic body of water, Mm-hmm. could only have been named that by people who did not have access to a microscope. <laughs> yeah, because right. there's a lot of life in the Dead Sea. Salt, I, no fishes, I kinda, no vertebrate I fishes. I kind of get the feeling that the Dead Sea was named because somebody drank it, and then everybody <laughs> else was like, you see what happened? <laughs> you, everybody, don't, you see what just happened? <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> water, water, all around, and not a drop not to a, drink. There right. you go. Yeah, there um, you go. <laughs> so, so tell me about that. I, I read something about there's an algae pool nearby or in some other parts of your work. What's going on there? Well, so it's not really pools of algae. So we have these bubbling pools, right? And they're literally like, you literally have elemental sulfur precipitating out of these waters. And you can see- like, Sulfur, so it stinks. Oh, it, st- it stinks. And it's like, t- you think the Dead Sea is deadly? Oh no, Dallas is deadly you'll see when we're walking through there, you literally see if you get too close in the ground, there's so much um, hydrogen sulfide gas and carbon dioxide Ooh, gas. Wait, you, you got to tell Chuck, close, tell Chuck what hydrogen sulfide gas smells like. Um, rotten, rotting eggs. Right, no, listen, no you can, he's a comedian. You can do better than I that. Knew, I knew <laughs> it was, and I'm sitting here. I'm Car- sitting here holding, like, holding himself I'm in, trying my best. Stuff, you, know? I, you have no idea the amount of restraint I just <laughs> exercised. <laughs> I have 15 <laughs> fart jokes right now right. that are bubbling up in me. They're I backed up. up. That's the wrong way to talk about a fart joke. But the Chuck I, has the, the fart jokes backed up in that whole up. time you're talking about this. <laughs> and, uh, I was ready to explode with fart jokes. This is all I'm saying. <laughs> you know. Okay, so hydrogen sulfide, H2SO4, is that correct? 
uh, H2, H2S, actually. Oh, just H2S. Oh, H2SO4 H2S, is, yeah. is sulfuric acid. Okay. Yeah, this, and that's what's in the water, <laughs> is the H2S. The sulfuric acid is actually, there's H2S, low um, molarity. So, I mean, well, I don't know. I haven't touched the water. But in, in other acidic environments, usually the H2S is kind of low molarity. Because I've also worked in the Rio Tinto um, acid river system. And so the H2S is pretty low, like, it's not going to like immediately burn your skin off. You know, you'll, you'll get a nice peel. Okay. So that's the place. If you're going to eat beans, no one will blame you for anything. Yeah. Got, not at all. You got oh, yeah. to- total, the whole landscape to blame it on. Right. Okay. Yeah, I, would, no, I would do very notice. well there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I would do very well there. <laughs> yeah. Nobody's, nobody's going to notice a thing. <laughs> so Kenda, uh, what, what, where did you grow up? Um, I grew up in, I'm a Midwestern kid. I grew up in a town called Rockford, Illinois, which is just west of Chicago, about 90, about 90 miles. I went into Chicago a lot, of, a lot for, you know, going to see shows. Well, and... just to be clear, if you were just 90 miles west of New York City, you were across New Jersey into Pennsylvania. So <laughs> to, to, to index your location to be 90 miles in any direction from Chicago, um, does that mean there's no other big city you can tell us what you're near? Um... No, not, not where <laughs> I am, because I'm, cause I I'm west. Say. If I was east, I could say, you know, Detroit's Detroit, not far away. Detroit, all right. You know, right, if right, I was yeah, east yeah. of Chicago, but I'm west, so okay. no, it's kind of it's kind of open plains and cornfields and stuff. Yeah, right, okay. uh, north of me, though, is Green Bay. If I had straight north, you, you'd be in Green Bay. In a oh, few we've hours. all heard of Green Bay. So, yeah. so yeah. How do... Well, I'm a Bears fan, so, you know, let's not go there. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> the Bears. So how did you, uh, so uh, how do you land on Extremophiles as a career goal? Oh, well, you know, um, oh, this is interesting because I had a different hat on when I started my career. I actually started um, learning how to try to grow food and keep astronauts alive in um, uh, in habitats um, on other planets. That's I cool, too. A, Both of these are I cool. Started out, yeah. <laughs> I started out as a systems engineer um, working on space station and trying to keep people alive. But in my education, I, dual, I, I was, I'm nuts, and I um, did a dual degree i literally have two bachelor's degree one well, in engineering one in biology nuts. well generally if you're nuts you don't have to tell that to other people because it's just completely clear <laughs> it, it okay. is true yeah <laughs> by the way all you have to do is say i got two bachelor degrees at the same time and people That's will look okay. you and go you must be nuts <laughs> <laughs> okay. and, and and so part of yeah so yeah well yeah um and i like pain apparently so you know where did, there's that um Part of it, part of my training was to also learn about microbes because when growing, trying to grow plants and develop earth microcosms, you know, microcosms, you have to understand, you know, not only how humans live, but how everything else that's going to interact lives. So I took classes in, you know, um, aquatic ecology. I took classes in lake ecology. I took classes in plant biology, you know, and I took classes in microbiology. Well, wait, so, so, so at the end of the day, you realized you took two different majors worth of courses. Is that what happened mm-hmm. there? Yep. So what are the yep. two majors? Wow. What were the two? Uh, the first one was basically systems engineering. So it was all of, I took a full course of engineering classes and then I took a full course of general biology classes. Wow. And um, my engineering degree lets me specialize. So I was able to use a couple of my upper level biology classes for my specialization in engineering. So okay. so your PhD, what was the title of your PhD thesis? Oh my gosh. Hang on a second. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> like, I got to remember, a geobiological investigation of the hypersaline sediments of Pilot Valley, Utah, a terrestrial analog to ancient lake basins on Mars. Wow. wow. Okay. <laughs> That's why wow. I had to read it. I couldn't remember. I, I got to tell you right now, I'm sorry he asked. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I retract the question. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. The funny thing is, my PhD was still an engineering degree. I, I unintentionally got three engineering degrees along the way. I'm liking it. Oh, the, the masters along the way. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, aerospace engineering for my masters. Okay, so you are totally loaded. What do you think about since you're a microbiologist and you mm-hmm. were talking about growing food as one of your uh, mm-hmm. tasks when you were working on space stations? What do you think about Matt Damon growing poop potatoes on Mars? <laughs> poop potatoes on Mars. We need we need the final the final word there. He would have um, had some problems with his thyroid because of all the perchlorate in the in the um, in the regolith. So yeah. Wow. There, so basically, okay, wait, just to be clear, wait, 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 um, wait, I gotta unpack <laughs> that. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. So <laughs> on Earth we have soil, right, which is rich in microbes that yes. participate in the ecosystem. Yep. On the moon and on Mars, there is no soil. 
whatever yep, no, the not. dust is there is like is ground Power. up rock basically right and so yes. and you call it regolith we call it regolith because it has not been processed by microbes that we know of on the like for definitely not on the moon and on mars not that we know of and and we, we're not sure what the origin is of the organic matter that we have found so far on mars so re, um, we call it regolith because it's not soil like we know it on earth that has been processed over years by by microbes and um and other um element, other life elements and and there's not a significant amount of organic matter making it kind of a so he uh, would have had a, a thyroid problem so mm -hmm. when they picked him up to save him he basically would have had a goiter uh probably or some other crazy issues he, his 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 uh, metabolic system would have been having some weird issues because the chlorate you know actually kind of competes with iodine to bind on your thyroid and we know that mars has an abundance of perchlorate in the um, regolith and gotcha. that's actually something that um you know i'm working on with other scientists i'm it's kind of funny in my astrobiology life i'm starting to kind of go back to my roots. to my human spaceflight roots yeah, um cool. and bringing my astrobiology knowledge and my human spaceflight knowledge together as we're getting ready to go back to the moon well in in the next segment we're gonna pick up questions from our fan base uh, our patreon fan base uh, chuck has all the questions i haven't seen them and mm -hmm. uh, we're going to find out what the public has to ask you. And they're very, we, we got a good, we, we got good people out there. Who right. Listen to this show. They're scientifically literate and they want to get more scientifically literate. And that's what got this it. is all about. When Star Talk returns. We're back. Star Talk, Cosmic Queries. We're talking about extremophiles and alien worlds with one of the world's experts on that and apparently a whole lot of other stuff too. <laughs> We've got K Kenda Lynch who is a scientist at the Lunar and Planetary Institute in, in Houston and who specializes in bugs on Earth that do the backstroke in high temperature, high acid, high everything else that would kill us post haste. And we're loving it. Uh, so, so uh, Kenda, also, uh, where, where might we find you on social media? Um, I am on Twitter and I am on Facebook. I have an Instagram, but I need to use it more. But I'm MarsGirl42 on Twitter for sure. Whoa. Good name. Cool. Thank good you. name. <laughs> it's a good one. And well, and you can also find me on the LPI website as well. Okay. The Lunar Planetary Institute. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very cool. A and we're going to find you in episode two of, of Alien Worlds, uh, Netflix, the yes. Netflix docuseries. Yes. Very cool. Okay. Yes. So Chuck, th this is a Cosmic query. So uh, we, we put out the call, and so what did you get? Well, we got uh, we got a bunch of people who actually, um, believe it or not, are super interested in this yeah. subject. <laughs> <laughs> no, I believe it. I believe it. It's like weirdly interesting, you know. Uh, yeah, it okay. really is. It really is. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's start off with our with our favorite. Uh, this is Violetta uh, and her mom. Uh, it says, "Isn't that child Leo? grown up by now?" She's she in college by now, Violetta. She, she she used to write it when she was like 11 and 12. And, oh no, when she was 11 and 11 and a half and 12 yep. and 12 and a half. Wow. Okay, well, here we go. This is uh, hi, Neil. Hi, Chuck. Hi, Kenda. Violetta here, the 13 and a half year old. <laughs> the 13 and a half. The full up teenager. Okay. So right. you said it, Neil. She, she did 11 <laughs> and then 12, 12 and a half. Now she's 13 and a half. And a half. All right. I love okay. It. Uh, she says, I'm writing in from Washington, D.C. And my question is what is the most surprising, fascinating life form or trait about a life form here on Earth that you have discovered or learned about in your career so far? Ooh. How did this impact the way you think about what life might look like elsewhere in the universe? Thanks, guys. And I just want to say to Dr. Lynch <laughs> that the world needs more scientists that look like you. Whoa! By that, wow. by that she means fabulous. <laughs> um, Looking fabulous. Yeah, fabulous. <laughs> and she says, thank you so yeah. much for doing and being an inspiration. Ooh, nice. Oh, thank you so much, Violetta. So, oh my gosh, there's so many. There's What's so many the weirdest crazy... bug out there? You, it's got, you, got, you probably have posters that rank them. Weirdest <laughs> to, don't tell me that you don't know what your, what your answer is here. Well, I'll give you my number one favorite because I just think it's so crazy. The thought of it is just so crazy. My, my favorite bug is, um, 
is the um, is the one that can live on nuclear reactors. <laughs> it's and does it have a name? Yes, and I'm trying to remember. <laughs> it's not. It's not the tardigrade. It's not the tardigrade. It's not the tardigrade because tardigrade is not. It's a that tardigrade is a micro is a small organism, but it's a multicellular organism. It's um. Okay, but just tell us more about it. So it can live like inside a nuclear reactor. It can live on. They found it living on nuclear reactions. It could take these high doses of of radiation, and it's got this cool shape. It's actually kind of like a cube almost shape. Okay, in Japan, those things turn into Godzillas. You realize? <laughs> I that. was going to say. <laughs> That's how that's how yeah. you got you're, all of those yeah, Japanese so that, it, monsters. <laughs> you're talking about a Marvel origin story right now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so somebody, it, it's um, um <laughs> it's I, oh yeah, I, I, the name will come to me and I'll spit it out at some point later. Okay, <laughs> I know I will. All right, so so you like the radiation resistance of that? I just I just think it's amazing that. Again, it's this whole thing about every time we think we got bugs figured out, like, okay, here's their radiation limit. Here's their life water limit. Here's their cold limit. Here's their hot limit. And then bugs are going like, yeah, no. And they blow us right away. We and got like, this. Yeah, yeah, we, we got this. Away. We got this. We got this. All right. So, so is this, a, this is a single celled organism? Yes. This is a single celled organism. Got it. Okay. Yes. Um, right. Whereas the tardigrade is a whole macroscopic object with legs and, and. Right. It's a multicellular organism, but it's still small and it's still something that has amazing amazing resilience and and can survive incredible incredible environments so mm -hmm. i'd be excited if we could find something like the tardigrade like on another planet because it definitely has developed strategies to live in crazy environments it kind of basically desiccates itself and like goes dormant and goes into like a it's like you know it's they call it a water bear so it goes into hibernation this really crazy like dehydrated hibernation and it can survive all sorts of inc inc insane environments including being exposed to space. Oh man, there's a whole episode of Star Trek Discovery devoted to a space tardigrade that they find <laughs> that helps them navigate the mycelium network. And the mycelium, cosmic mycelium network is this thing that allows you to move faster than light because you <laughs> enter this network that kind of transports you almost instantaneously to different locations throughout the, the universe. universe. I oh. love it, I love it. <laughs> Well, who would have thought tardigrades were also spacefaring? Well, uh, they, if they came from space initially, right. that's the big yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, cool. Well, let's get the next question. <laughs> Chuck, what else you got? All righty, let's do it. This is, uh oh, uh, Nander, Nander Sirkel. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Right, that's his, that's your name now, man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Take it or leave it. Okay. Ah, here we go. <laughs> He says, I often wonder, when we're looking for life out there, aren't we a bit biased by our own conditions for life itself, like ah. water or breathable air? Even when yes. considering silicon life forms, this still assumes creatures living on planets. Do you think it would be reasonable to consider, for example, other scales of life in size and space-time? Maybe some life forms would be the size of planets, even galaxy or quantum particles moving in time so fast that we, as slowpokes, can't even see them. Whoa. So, Kendra, uh, what, what part of your PhD <laughs> thesis dealt with quantum? <laughs> quantum life forms. Uh, not much of it, but I'll tell you, I, I was a fan of Star Trek Next Generation, so I'm there with this person's questions, you know. Mm -hmm. But quantum... Quantum life forms. So not not part of that, but in astrobiology, we really do think about um, what we call as life as we don't know it, or um, what some people like to call weird life. Um, and we try to think when we're looking for life, we try to do, we're developing this way to try to think what we call agnostically about life, which means so life as we don't know it or weird life. So yeah, th there's the problem. We only have one data point, Earth. And life, and life on Earth. And even your extremophiles are part of that one data point. Yes, everybody, even though they're extreme and they can live on reactors or breathe iron or, you know, eat other crazy, you know, metals and things like that. And rocks. <laughs> eat rocks, yeah. And, and, and even though they can do these crazy things, they all ha still have the same amino acids as we do. They have the same stereochemistry as we do. And we all have the same fundamental, um, basically, code. We have DNA and RNA. They all have the same fundamentals. We all have that same base code of life that kind of builds the structure of life. So yeah, when we think about life on another planet, we, we have to think about life as we don't know it. What if they, what 
if they use a completely different stereochemistry? What if they use a different set of amino acids to build their proteins? What if, you know, what if they have a different liquid? I was just getting asked this in a, in a previous conversation about, you know, what about Titan where we have lakes of methane? It's a fluid and life needs fluid for a chemistry. And Titan, Saturn's largest moon. Yeah, where we've Titan, actually yep. been there. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we're sending a beautiful little helicopter that's going to go and land and, and study um, the surface uh, and those lakes and some of the organic sands there and try to try to understand um, the possibility for prebiotic chemistry on Titan. And that's the question is, is prebiotic chemistry possible in, you know, that kind of environment and what would it look like and what could life look like being, you know, arising in that kind of environment? One, one, one of my favorite New Yorker comics was uh, there's a crashed flying saucer in the desert and these two aliens are just crawling along the sands and one says to the other, ammonia, ammonia. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. That's Total, I mean, that's totally it, right? I mean, it doesn't, I mean, on Earth, it just happened that water was the thing that was going to be, yeah. you know, the basis for chem for life's chemistry. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that's how it's going to work on other planets. And that's something that we do have to think about. And we actually have scientists that study that weird life and kind of study that chemistry and see, well, what, what could be possible? What could happen? So, um, you know, and then thinking about the larger scale of life, we do have scientists that are, you know, they look at things called techno signatures. So we try to understand the scale of, you know, uh, contacting other intelligent you know what we call intelligent i mean forms of life don't get me started on the intelligent comment you know i don't know yeah we, uh, we're not even that yet <laughs> right, right. We're, we're thank still, you. the jury's still <laughs> out on that the one. jury's still out on us yeah mm -hmm. so yeah exactly <laughs> so, so can i ask both of you this mm -hmm. um is there a finite chemistry in the universe i know we have the period pretty periodic table um is there anything that could be outside of that that could actually contribute to life that is not on our periodic table no 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 that can't question. happen no. everything, <laughs> everything everything that we know now there may be other elements that we haven't discovered just because we haven't discovered them yet but no i mean because all life begins with stars you know right. you know all exactly. of our elements come from stars so the star stuff that's that's the one common thing that makes it possible for us to really think about this question is that's that the ingredients in the kitchen are all yeah, the same that's the, ingre the, the ingredients the in the kitchen are the same across the universe so that's it, it, right. helpful in fact chuck we we do we're doing better than that because we have created elements that the universe mm -hmm. has never seen before right. in exactly. our laboratories mm -hmm. wow. so we, yeah. we we created two dozen more elements or or 20 mm -hmm. yeah 20 or 20 yeah about two uh, 20 more elements than we're currently there. So, so let me let me ask you this, um, Kenda. If chemistry is the same, and basically geology is the same, right? You put a geologist on a planet. Oh, I know what rock this is. Or we might have a different kind of minerality, but it it, it won't be so foreign to them that they'll be befuddled. Right. Is there any reason? And and the physics is obviously the same. So if I have the same physics, the same chemistry the same geology why can't we think that maybe biology will go will all focus towards the same forms as we have here if everything else does that in the other branches of science well i mean that's a that's a loaded question because it's not <laughs> it, it's we can expect some of the same uh principal things to happen like there's going to be a, some kind of cell wall structure. There's going to be an encoding system. There's going to be some way to transfer information. There's going to be some way to move energy and generate energy. There's going to be some way to move things in and out of an interior environment. Those kind of things, yeah, we can kind of figure out that those kind of the, are the common elements that are going to make life happen for biology. And those are the kind of things that we agree. There, we agree that we actually kind of agree there's a common set okay. of, of about, about eight things that all life you know, anything that we call life would probably have going on. Now, how they get it and how they put it together, that's where that chemistry is different. And that's where <clears throat> the the environmental context that made the geology is probably different. That's going to matter. You know? okay, and that's mm -hmm. where, you know, you know, and that's where maybe some of the physics, because the gravity is a little different. So some things are slightly different that help, you know, drive that environmental context. So I that can say that you're mm -hmm. not going to expect life forms the size of galaxies. No. Can I tell you there. why? I'll tell you why. Okay. Why? Okay. So a ga our galaxy is 100,000 light years across. Okay? 100,000. If that were a life form and one part of it had an itch, how long yeah. would it take to scratch that itch? 
right. if you can't you can't move faster than the speed of light <laughs> mm-hmm. so so it has an itch and then it brings one part of it to over to the other part to scratch it a hundred thousand years later it scratches the itch this is not very effective right. it, this is not a, a this is not a coherently functioning organism right, right. and exactly. if evolution requires a lot of experimenting then the life form has to be able to change either on purpose or by accident fast enough so that you can have enough of these experiments for it to take on interesting forms exactly and yeah. and if you're really really big that doesn't happen so yeah, and, because and I mean, if it takes a hundred thousand years to scratch an itch just imagine how uncomfortable it would be when its underwear gets stuck in its butt <laughs> okay <laughs> <sighs> I, I'm more thinking about the size of the underwear at this point. You know? no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> just, oh, just, just, just to be clear, I wear boxer briefs, and boxer briefs don't get stuck in your butt. Oh, okay. oh just, look, you it's know. you, sexy saying. bragging. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if we can squeeze one more in before the break. All righty. <laughs> Let's do it. Here we go. This is Akilisha. Uh Kashyap. Man. <laughs> Y'all just messing with me now, man. That ain't a no. real name. Okay, it's A K H I L E S H. Achilles. Achilles. Kashyap. C K A S H Y A P. Kashyap. I hope. Okay. Okay. Hello, Dr. Tyson. We'll give you a B minus on that one, but go on. I get an A minus? Okay. A B minus, I said. Oh, okay. B minus. Damn. You just keep, I keep going down. Before you know it, it's just like you're expelled. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Dr. Tyson. Hello, Dr. Lynch and Lord Nice. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm a first time Patreon member. Nice. And my question is if we discover life on a restricted body like Europa, or Enceladus, are we allowed to study them only through orbiting satellites? Or can we bring something back home and cut them open for science, of course? I mean, you went dark there. You went dark at the end, bro. Okay. You, you started off with- uh, to Real good. To, you, you started off with our continuing mission. <laughs> To really? seek out new life, new civilizations, <laughs> and then you ended up with let's just cut these suckers open. Cut. Well, well, be careful. There's some folks around where Kendra hangs out in Texas. Where can we bring it back and barbecue it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, yeah. We will, we, yeah. We will get to that answer after, after the break on Star Talk Cosmic Queries with astrobiologist Kendra Lynch. We're back for the third and final segment of Star Talk Cosmic Queries. Kenda Lynch is with us, who's an expert in microbes on Earth as possible analogs to microbes in the universe. So, so uh, Kenda, uh, over the break, you uh, you remembered this this uh, radioactivity loving microbe. The name yes. of it. What, what's it called? Yes, it's called Deinococcus radiodurans, and they love, they literally can live on, um, they found them on nuclear reactors, and they are very... Um, Deinococcus? Mm-hmm, Deinococcus, Deinococcus. Radiodurans. This sounds like a, a rock group. It does. <laughs> it doesn't it? <laughs> it really does, you know? <laughs> Chicago, are you ready? <laughs> Deinococcus radiodurans. Radio Rock it out! <laughs> Wow, that's cool. cool, man. Okay, so we left off with a question about, what was it, Chuck? So uh, he wants to know that if we discover life on a, rest- a, st- a restricted body, like yes. Europa or Enceladus. It's protected by NASA law, basically. Prote- yes. Right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, can we actually study it just through satellites orbiting, or can we bring back something and cut it open? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, um, you know, to cut it open, wow. Uh, so well, Let me just I back mean, up for a second. So NASA mm-hmm. has a department of mm-hmm. planetary protection. And there, there's, 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 a, there's a code within them, which is it, not, not a computer code, but a, a behavioral code, whereas there are these selected objects in the solar system that may have life. 
we don't mess with them, or if we do, we go in a highly, highly sterilized way. And if we bring anything back to Earth, we want to keep that quarantine to make sure it doesn't kill us. That's their job. Yeah, and that's the, that's the Planetary Protection Office. And the answer is, we're moving into this phase of science where we are trying to bring things back because we realize that we need to bring things back to be able to study them better, to understand if there's life in them or not. Right now, we're in the process with the Perseverance rover in the um, in Jezero Crater for the Mars 2020 mission. They're caching samples that we're going to send a, a lander to go and pick up those samples and hand them off from the rover, and we're going to bring those samples back to Earth from Mars. And we actually are have missions that are being developed to go to try to land on both Europa and Enceladus. And Enceladus is my favorite. It's one of my favorite icy moons, by the way. I love Enceladus. Um, to try to understand, um, to look at the surface and maybe eventually try to get a sample, <clears throat> a sample that that came up from the subsurface ocean on both of those planets. Um, you know that we can we can study in situ, and maybe someday we can figure out how to bring those back. But right now, the goal is to just try to get to land on the surface and try to study samples in situ to see if we can find evidence for for possible um, biosignatures of life. I, so I, I may be I mistaken with this question, but I'm just going to ask it. Did did we not learn from what's Madam Saturn, what Carol, Carolyn Porco, mm -hmm. that they're going to try to fly something through one of the plumes? of Enceladus and maybe collect what's being, you know, pushed out of the uh, the ice? Yeah, we have a we have a mission that's gonna try to do that. I um, Well, we also have a Europa Clipper that's going back to Europa um, that's gonna, that's gonna, that might even be able to do that with Europa Clipper, but we're also trying to fly through the plumes of Enceladus. We have the Enceladus Orbilander concept that is looking at doing that, like orbiting, but also sending a lander down to the surface to pick up, to, to do some in situ science on the surface of Enceladus, hopefully near one of the tiger claws where all this stuff is spewing out. Okay, so, so that's, that's the third time you said in situ. <laughs> in <Sorry>. five sentences. <laughs> in situ. In means... situ. Excuse me, Madam Latin there. <laughs> okay. Sorry, the Latin, that's all science, especially biology. We like we like throwing Latin around. Throw do Latin Every, just, everything just give me has some a Latin. Latin name. Everything has a Latin name in biology. Yeah, yeah, it's Latin. So yeah. so let me emphasize something that I think you you said but just wafted by it. Um, the the ice on Europa is very thick, but it also cracks and then water seeps up in the cracks and refreezes. So you're going to be, you're going to be um, astrophysically lazy, and instead of trying to dig through the ice, you're going to try to see if there's anything that came up through the ice and froze there that requires no digging at all. Right. Well, oh. I mean, through, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, um, it, it might require some digging for the, you know, the subsurface, but there are, um, you know, we have some really brilliant scientists, that, not me, um, but some of my colleagues that are really brilliant that study. Other brilliant the scientists, yes. Um, the sci uh, <laughs> the other brilliant scientists, not me, because I don't study ice dynamics. I'm a, you know, I'm the biology one, but they study kind of that geology of those ice dynamics, and they found that that there is likely water that is seeping up from the ocean and and kind of connecting in, in the shallow subsurface and and doing things that they can actually see on the surface from remote sensing and if that water below the surface had life it would have gurgled up and frozen in yeah. place you yeah. know freeze-dried life to study yeah exactly if we can access some of those areas where that life probably kind of gurgled up and then on Celadus, of course we've got you know the tiger claws just spewing you know stuff out into space so we can try to capture some of that and then we can also land yeah. on the surface mm -hmm. to try to see what we can see that maybe kind of fell back down okay maybe, so how you know. sterilized do your probes have to be to land on a protected body oh very sterile <laughs> they, that, that's the challenge of doing this uh, is that yeah you've got to make sure not only that the lander is very sterile but that um that you know all the instruments that you're working on are very sterile. everything everything, everything. and there are they're even a coronavirus on found on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just make the, and... make the lander wear a mask. Yeah. <laughs> That's a very... <laughs> just like make sure you wear your mask, lander. And, and use hand sanitizer. Use right? hand sanitizer yeah. and show us your vax card before you touch that. <laughs> <laughs> so, All right, yeah. Chuck, give me another one. Another question, Chuck. All right. All right. Before, you know what? I got to ask this just before we go. I know I'm not a Patreon. I know. I, but. So when you talk about this water underneath this basically, you know, this planet, uh, you got the ice like a crust and then the water underneath, but then you have other bodies in space that are just frozen solid pieces of water. Why doesn't the planet just freeze all the way down? Why is there water underneath that ice? That can mean, on just, the moons, the no, moons. Yeah, on yeah. the moons, on not the, moons. the planet, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. Why do we 
why do we have these ocean worlds on moons around on moons. and Saturn? Yes. The, well, first of all, a couple of different things. First, first of all, um, there is um, we get heating from the gravity, the extreme gravity that causes what we call tidal heating, and and and, um, and Neil can probably explain that better. That that kind of pushes and flexes and causes heating that kind of adds some heating to the planet and keeps it warm. Plus, these waters have lots and lots and lots and lots of salt, lots of salt that are keeping that are depressing the freezing the 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 the, the freezing point. So. The salt, the water is able to stay liquid because there's so much salt in it that that freezing point gets lowered because there's so much salt in it keeping it liquid. It's been rumored that zero on the Fahrenheit scale is the freezing temperature of a supersaturated solution of, of, of brine, of, of, of salt water. It's been rumored. Um, and so that's where you get a zero. That's the coldest liquid they could get that would freeze. And then regular water just goes, freezes at the warmth of 32 degrees on, a, on the Fahrenheit scale. But yeah, no, you said it perfectly, uh, Kenda, just the tidal stress between Jupiter and the tugs of other surrounding moons are pumping energy in. And so now it's a heat source that just has nothing to do with the sun. I'm, I learn in my biology books, you need sunlight for life. What you really need is just energy. If you take the physics angle on you just need energy. And you pump energy in from, from tidal forces, you got it. Right, and what they think is going on in Enceladus is they actually think that heat is also generating kind of, and maybe it's maybe some residual heat, but probably more of the tidal forces on Enceladus generating heat that's causing hydrothermal hydrothermal vents, like what we see on Earth. You know, the deep sea hydrothermal vents with the black smokers and things that you see, like on the National Geographic videos. They think that that's what they're seeing in the uh, in Enceladus, and that's kind of what's kind of helping to kind of possibly generate the tire claws pushing pushing that energy out. And that is creating a lot of cool chemistry that life can live, that life could take advantage of. So, Kenda, we've had Natalie Starkey on the show, who, mm -hmm. who wrote a book recently on uh, all the cool, literally and figuratively, things in the universe. <laughs> uh, volcanoes, hot and cold, and yes. she describes Enceladus as a, as an ice volcano world. Yeah, and, probably and the, the plumes been. are just where you just need extra pressure buildup. It didn't have to be hot compared to us. It mm -hmm. could just be pressure in its own environment, even if it's very cold. So, yes. yeah, very cool. Yeah, Chuck, keep it coming. Awesome. Yeah, you keep can't get better than that. Uh, that's so cool. Cryovolcanism. If Ooh. that doesn't, if that doesn't make you love science, you're I dead know. inside. Yeah, I want that on my business card. <laughs> exactly. I'm a cryovolcanist. You know, what are you? Okay. <laughs> All right, here we go. This is William D. A. Thank you, William. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> he says, <clears throat> given that humans have always been fighting a war with tiny bacteria, viruses, and prions, etc., how likely do you think it is that there's a planet out there with a tiny microscopic organism and it wiped out the more complex life? What would such a planet look like long term? And uh, it's, uh, mm. that's what he said. Uh, so if oh. we're in a war with, if, if we all got killed by a virus here, then what happens long term, even if it's just here on Earth? Yeah, ultimately, do all the little things kill all the big things, and you just have a planet full of viruses um, <laughs> or single-celled organisms? Yeah. yeah what? What is? It, where does biology go right. in the long hey, term? Hey, what's up, well, Corona? What's up, Streptococcus? <laughs> well, <laughs> what is, given that we've already had. Hey, rhinovirus, how you doing today? Yeah, everybody's just chilling. <laughs> all the viruses. Got cities and things. Yeah. You know. Get out of here, herpes. <laughs> 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 you weren't invited to the party. You know you got invited, man. <laughs> um, you know, given that we've already had multiple mass extinction events on the planet already, um, where we've, where like, uh, not necessarily microbes have taken out the, our bigger organism, but something else, usually an asteroid or something else, took out um, our larger eigen organisms. Uh, life has just kind of rebounded, and yeah, for a while, the the little guys were, you know. The little guys were in charge, but life eventually kind of picked back up, and 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 organisms got more. Got, you know, there's there's an advantage on Earth for multicellular multicellularity, and so life eventually kind of worked its way back to um, multicellularity at some point. You know, and those small guys got bigger and bigger and more complex and more complex each time. But we've, you know, so 
Um, oh, I would say is if we had a micro-generated mash extinction event, my guess is, yeah, for a while the little guys would be in charge, but then eventually, um, you know, depending on the, you know, the environment of Earth, if it's advantageous to take advantage of resources and to keep yourself alive, to become multicellular, life would probably go back to being multicellular or having a multicellular component on the planet. That's an excellent argument because if we've done it multiple times in the past, why not again? I mean, after the KT extinction, yeah. nothing bigger than, you know, a suitcase like, or something. You know, yeah, like a, a, squirrels and rats. Yeah, and a duffel bag with the yeah. biggest size life form. And now we yeah. have, you know, the blue whale swim in the ocean, mm -hmm. the largest animal there ever was so mm -hmm. a very good argument there yeah i'm with you on that okay. that's very cool so we got time for like one more i think what do you got all right let's uh let's go to kevin the sommelier no oh kevin well, says all right. I like yes right. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna party with you kevin yeah <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly kevin says you know when i'm sitting around drinking a chateau neuf de pop but the, no, it. does he say uh, no? No, he doesn't. No, <laughs> no, no, no. I just, I just threw that in there. <laughs> okay. I thought that'd All be right. cool. It is cool. I, I wish he did start like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Kevin says astrobiology used to be termed exobiology. Was this just a rebranding to make people more interested in it? Like when Coke introduced new Coke, <laughs> had, but had to go back to classic Coke? Well, keep drinking up, Kevin the Samonier. <laughs> That's a very good question that I, I'm, I'm thinking about here because, you know, the reality is, is that when I fell in love with this, it was exobiology. When I was, and I'm not going to date myself, but when I got my first lecture, it was from this gentleman named Donald DiVincenzi, who was a part of what was called the exobiology office at NASA. And FYI, NASA always had an exobiology office. NASA started with an exobiology office. So this has been a question that NASA has wanted answered since the beginning of NASA. So this has been kind of part of our charter from the beginning. And so... I think the big transition came obviously after the, the Viking results, but I think the big transition to astrobiology came after um, the Allen Hills Rock and the discovery of the organics in the Allen Hills Rock and you know the 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 um, the, um, the the hypothesis that these were organics were made by Martian microbes and these kind of microbes made these special you know the whole argument about the biogenicity of the organic um, feet structures in right. The, the Allen Hills Rock Allen is Hills about rock. the size of a Idaho potato. Been sitting yeah. on the shelf for years. Mm -hmm. was, we knew it was a meteorite, but no one mm -hmm. really knew much about it until, like you said, the Viking mission. We have accurate measurements of the atmosphere of Mars from that mission, and po air pockets trapped in that rock matched that air exactly. And yes. oh my gosh, yeah, a and rock from Mars sitting on the, the shelf. The age of SNC rocks, um, meteorites was born. I never mind looking ignorant because it's my specialty. <laughs> Please tell me what the Allen Hills rock is. The Allen Hills is a Mars meteorite. We know, as, as Neil said, that it came from Mars because we look at these little, little bubbles in it that keep gases in it, and we're able to extract the gas and look at the gas composition, and it tells us that it has the exact same composition of, of the gases on Mars from our Viking results. And so we know that this meteorite was a piece of Mars that got blasted off and traveled to Earth and, and kind of landed on Earth. And so Allen Hills is one of what we call an SNC or a Mars meteorite that came from Mars. Cool. And uh, just for just for, for, for background, yeah. there's a set of hills in Antarctica mm -hmm. called the Allen Hills, where the glacier that is like permanently on Antarctica for now, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, as it migrates, it comes up against the hills. And if any rock fell from space and landed on this glacier, it gets dragged to these hills and deposited there. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's 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 a really convenient way to scoop up meteorites without having to comb thousands of square miles of area. You right. let the glacier do it for you. Right. So it's in Allen Hills, um, and it was found in 1984. Right. Wow. So, yeah. and, cool. and they still do, and they do still do annual trips, um, or they had been. I don't know if they stopped because of COVID for a while to Antarctica to look to go out and look on the glaciers for meteorites. Because anywhere else, you actually have to watch it fall to go, kind of go look for it, or you have to. You know, and we've had we have people send us rocks, especially at the LPI, all the time. I think it's a meteorite, and it's not. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's here we call them meteor wrongs. That's yeah, exactly. They're meteor wrongs. Yeah. No, exactly. the point is, um, it, uh, is it most certainly, it possibly as much as half of all meteorites in our collections come from these ice sheets. 
and people wonder, well, do the meteor the, the, the meteors aim for the ice sheets? No, that's the only place you would find them if they fell. Otherwise, you have to sift through countless other rocks in the forest right. to know which I, one came from space and which didn't. Right. So. And most of the ones that are verified that weren't fallen on the glacier is because somebody watched it fall and tracked it. Yeah, exactly. It, and that's exactly. about it. So, but the point, the point is, is that after, you know, we got Allen Hills, and this was back in, uh, I think it was like 92, 93, is that right? Um, when they this, this study came out, and they thought that this happened and everybody, you know, kind of disagreed and we had, you know, arguments back and forth about are they life, are they not life? And then we realized, do we really understand what life is? And this is about the time that we started learning about, you know, we started learning more about extremophiles and the RNA world, the, ex the vastness of the RNA world. And we started learning more about biotechnology and our capabilities for, um, you know, for, you know, higher sample um, resolution and sample, um, sa and sample detectability. Um, uh, you know, and our instruments got higher. So all of this kind of stuff made us start to question. I mean, um, instruments got more sensitive. Yeah, yes, thank mm -hmm. you, more sensitive. I <laughs> can't find my words today. <laughs> That's fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, all of these things kind of together, kind of, you know, with that Allen Hills discovery, and at that time they went back and looked at the Viking results and, and realized that Viking would not have necessarily caught everything because of the, 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 the sensitivity wasn't high enough, right? Mm -hmm. So there's all of these things going on. Um, you know, we started asking the question, like, what do we really know about life? Do we really understand life on Earth? Do we really understand the extent of life or what is alive on Earth? And so that's where astrobiology, because it was looking, exobiology was like looking for life elsewhere, but astrobiology includes understanding how life on Earth also came to be. How did we become to be a living planet? So that's where the new term astrobiology came from because it became about looking for life on Earth, looking for life in the universe, but also trying to understand how did we become the data point that we have now? How did we become to be here? Yeah. So I take the meta view, which is everything the astrophysicist does in space has a counterpart here on Earth. And so you want to glue together astro in front of each of those words. So we have astrochemistry, astrobiology, <laughs> astroparticle physics. At, so astro... We, <laughs> we're the push cart for it all. I just want right, to say. Right, there you go. <laughs> yeah. I like that one too. <laughs> Fun, funny how the astrophysicists become the quarterback of the team. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Oh, so, I get it. Mm, yeah, there you go. <laughs> we got appointed by the universe itself to be uh, that role. Well, no. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> um, so, Kenda, I remember when uh, that Alan Hills rock made news. And it was a research paper by some folks at Johnson Space Center making the claim that maybe this has evidence for life, which meant life was on Mars. I remember it like it was yesterday. And there was some chemistry within the rock. And then there was a, there was a photo of the, a worm-looking thing on the surface. Yeah. And we didn't know what it was. It was really mm -hmm. tiny. Mm -hmm. But it was just kind of intriguing. It made a good headline photo. But the, the better evidence was from the other chemistry going on in the rock. Yeah. I was on a talk show to comment on this rock. And they had me, a philosopher, and a biologist. And the philosopher said, how do we know whether the rock itself is not alive? Okay, we got that out of the way. <laughs> we got to make that comment. Stop and smoking then, weed, dude. <laughs> <laughs> we have to get past that. And then, so then they put up the photo of this worm thing, and the biologist says, that can't possibly be life. And I'm thinking, wow, the biologist must know a lot to know that that can't be. So, so I said, well, how come? And he says, oh, because that's one-tenth the size of the smallest microbes on Earth. And I then said, last I checked, this is from Mars. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, and I realized how narrow the thinking was of biologists. Mm -hmm. Because like you began this program, Kenda, if you... If all you have is a data sample of one, mm -hmm. you have no capacity to think differently. Right. Everything has to be shoehorned into your own understanding of the world. And I was perfectly happy to have it be a life form that we don't know anything about. Mm -hmm. Deal with it. Yeah. And that biologist today is working at McDonald's. <laughs> 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 I don't remember All right. who that was, so, but I don't know. Probably not. We, we got to call it quits there. Uh, Ken, it has been a delight to have you on the show. I remember you when you were in graduate school. You're all grown up now. So, she's all grown up. <laughs> Such an honor to be here. And I'm so glad that you remember me. Actually, and... finally found you in the ether. Yeah. <laughs> and 
Uh, we can find you on Netflix, uh, episode two of yep. Alien World. And we're loving it. And uh, Chuck, always good to have you there, my co-host. Dude. Always a pleasure. All right. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist. Keep looking up.